My name is David Godman. I mostly live in South India, near the ashram of Ramana Maharshi. I discovered Ramana and his ideas when I was at college in 1974. I went out to India on a visit to just find out for myself what was going on there. That was 1976. I liked it so much I fell in love with the place and more or less I stayed and that was 44 years ago. I'll tell you a little bit about him. He was born in the late 19th century in South India, had a very normal upbringing. And then at the age of 16, he had a spontaneous waking up. He had a fear of death, a very intense fear of death, and he was absolutely convinced he was about to die. But instead of panicking, he watched the process inside himself and conducted a kind of internal inquiry as to what was going to die and what would survive if this death came. To whom would the death come? To what would it come? And what would survive that particular death? So along with that fear, he spontaneously asked himself a question. Who is the one who sees? Who is the perceiver? Who is registering this world around me? As that inquiry took place instantly, he said this perceiving I, this thing inside himself, which saw a world outside of himself, actually vanished. And he said the net result was that he found himself in what he called the natural state of self. It's something that you can aspire to, it's something that you can become one with, and you get to it by discarding your own sense of individuality, your own idea that you're an individual person occupying a particular space. With him, he didn't have to do anything, he didn't have a prolonged period of practice. It just happened very quickly, very spontaneously, and from the age of 16 onwards, he said he was in that state permanently 24 hours a day. So he had no agenda, if you like. He didn't feel he had to go out and rush around and tell people about this great discovery. He was quite content to abide in this state, this undercurrent which he'd become one with, but people naturally got attracted to him. He left home at the age of 16. He went to a very famous religious pilgrimage center in South India and stayed there. There was something about him. He'd got this innate capacity to make people quiet, peaceful and happy, not by doing anything, simply by people sitting in his presence, it happened to them. He realized that he couldn't really run away, that wherever he was, this would happen. So he, shall we say, resigned himself to his fate and sat quietly in this major pilgrimage center in South India. Over time, thousands of people came and they just sat with him. So when people said, what are your teachings? He didn't have a, a list of ideas or words. He said, my teachings are the silence that comes off me when I just sit here minding my own business. So, so people would come and if they were in a relatively quiet state themselves, they would experience something of that silence. He wrote very little, spoke very little. I think for the vast majority of people, the reason they went to see him was something about his proximity, something about the way he looked at them, that there was something transformative about being around him. And for the vast majority of people, that was enough. But if people were saying, I'm not getting it, how do I find out for myself what is this state that you are saying that you're in? I'm not experiencing now even though I'm sitting here, what do I do? So the what do I do question, the general response, he would tell you to do something called self-inquiry. On a moment to moment, you might be seeing something right now. I can see plants, I can see lights. There's a subject inside me that I call David, but I call, also call it I. That's the subject, the object are the plants, the bags, everything I can see are the objects of my attention. So this idea, that you're a person inside a body only appears to exist because you're constantly looking at things and saying, I am seeing this, I am feeling this, I am experiencing this. If you could instead put attention on the inner feeling of I, this state of interior I-ness, so that when you say, I am hungry, I am angry, I am a man, I am a lawyer, the central core, the central thread, like the string going through a necklace, is the I upon which everything else becomes the predicate. Hold on to this sense of I and don't let it jump out, don't let it associate with anything else and you will find it's a myth, it's a fiction. It only appears to exist 
because all of these other things are grabbing hold of it and giving it a completely false sense of continuity, making you think that you're a person inside a body. Hold on to this perceived inner sense of I. Every time something else tries to take your attention away from it, he just said, no, not interested today. Like the salesman at the door, just go away, not today, thank you. Go back to the perceiving eye, the subject eye, and he said, you'll notice that when it no longer has an impulse to reach out, to connect, to associate, then it actually starts to subside and eventually it disappears and it reveals that same state, that same substratum that he said he got permanently and definitively at the age of 16. There's simply an innate knowledge that what you are is what's true, what's real, and it's not associated or identified with anything. It just is as it is. That's the whole point. Whatever you think about, whatever you feel, is not you. The you is the I who experiences. I am angry, I am happy, I am two meters tall. Everything that you add on to the I is a predicate that you've assumed somehow qualifies or colors in new aspects of you. But it doesn't. It's possible to have an I that's not associated, not connected with any of these predicates or attributes. And what he is saying is that by constant vigilant awareness of the I that is making up this story, you challenge it, you look at it, you stop it making the connections, and slowly, slowly it withdraws, and finally it gets to the point it disappears, and you say, ha, huh, yes, that's what, that's what I am, that's what I always was. Everything, everything else was a kind of a fiction, a layer that appeared on top of me because I didn't look at this I long enough or hard enough to discover its true nature. There's a single substance or essence which he called self, simply because that's what you are, and that's why he used the word self. In traditional Eastern Hinduism, it's called Brahman, Atman. But he liked to use the word self, I think, to emphasize the fact it wasn't something that you went looking for that was different from you. It, it is what you are, and what you are is your own self. So I, he liked the word self because the connotations of that are it's not something new or different that you go looking for, it's what you already are. It's not some state or experience that you attain because any, anything you attain is somehow time-bound. You, you got it in time and over time it will disappear. What he's talking about is something that's there all the time, which has always been there, but somehow it was covered up because you invented this personality, this occupant of the body, who bought into a whole bunch of myths about living there, about being there, about being an individual who existed in a spatial universe across a period of time. So if you limit yourself to a particular form, then you have to defend that form against all other forms. You're in a constant battle to maintain the integrity of that form, to keep it healthy. You come into contact, into conflict with other forms that you take to be like yourself. You fear the ones that are bigger and stronger than you. All of these ideas are outgrowths of this fundamental wrong idea I am a person who occupies a body, I live here, therefore I have to fight my corner, I have to defend myself against all other forms, all, all other people who think that they also occupy bodies and have to behave the same way. There's an alternative. If you can get rid of that through putting full attention on this sense of I inside yourself, then all the things you thought about yourself, thought about the world, he said, they all go out the window. They're all a complete myth. What I'm teaching you is a subject-based practice that you keep full attention on your inner sense of I, I am, of being, of existing. But I think Ramana recognized that a lot of people did have busy lives, they had job commitments, they had family. He never ever gave anyone his permission or gave out advice to the effect that they should give up any of that. He said, look after your family, do your job, but don't waste your spare time. In every, every moment you have that's not required for doing various obligations that have come your way in life, look at your mind, watch how it functions, and you will note that there is this essence, this I thing inside yourself. That's the, it's the conductor of your internal orchestra. It's the person 
waving the bat on, make, making the music, making all your reactions. It's latching onto things, getting excited over them, becoming averse to them. All of these reactions are simply because you don't look at the nature of this thing that you call I. We all glibly say, I'm going to the bathroom, I'm going to the beach, I like this, I don't like that. And we don't look at this central thing called I, which is claiming authority, which is claiming occup occupancy of the body, and look at it to the point where you understand that it's just a framing mechanism. All the stuff that comes in, the thoughts, the ideas, the perceptions, they come in and they get processed in such a way that makes you think, I am, I am this person. I have to choose and decide what to do next. So if you want to stop being affected or overwhelmed by all the things that the game produces, have a look, I isolate this thing called I inside yourself, watch it, hold on to it, watch it go back to its source and disappear, and then you find the peace, the stillness, in which suffering can't arise at all. You have to want it enough and you have to want it more than all the other things that your mind is saying, this is more interesting, go and do that instead. You, you, you have to understand that running after all these ideas, these thoughts, these associations, not only doesn't make you any better, any happier, it actually makes you suffer. You have to frame your constant desire to indulge against the consequences of doing it and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go that route. So you need some discrimination. You need to say to yourself, I've lived my life for however many years. I've had all the suffering. I've had enough. This, this man is giving me a hypothesis. I'm going to check it out and see if it works. You don't have to believe anything. There's no belief system here. So I started doing it when I was at college in the 1970s. I got my instruction manual, if you like, from probably the only book available in the West at that time. What it said on the can was what I found inside. It did make me very peaceful. It did make me very happy. So I continued with it. In Ramana's day, people got very, I won't say annoyed with him, but they would say, oh, you're just throwing your Brahmastra at me. The, the Brahmastra in Hindu mythology is a secret weapon that defeats all other weapons. Every time you asked him a question, he would say, who, who is asking the question? And so you, 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 you never got the kind of answer that you wanted. He wanted to tell you that your question would be answered if you followed the advice and the procedures he was recommending. So people would come along and they would say, but what about my childhood memories? And his invariable answer was, who has these memories? Who is this person in front of me who claims to be a person who has a memory? Solve that problem and all your other problems are solved. So yes, you are right now you have memories of being a child, whatever your professional career, wherever you've gone, all your past emotions. Treat them all as objects in your field of attention. They are all occurring to, displaying themselves to a subject, and that subject is the I. When you say, I remember my childhood, I remember my parents, I remember going to this school, there's something inside yourself that seems to think that there's a continuity of this first personal pronoun, and that everything that's ever happened to you has happened to this first person pronoun, I. So he said, the way to get out of that particular idea is not to dwell on all your past thoughts, your past feelings, your past emotions, but to look at the nature of this thing that you've spent your whole life labeling as I and see what it is, how it arises, how it functions, and ultimately where it goes back to when it doesn't have anything to entertain itself with. But it's not a system of suppression. Ramana used to critique the, the yogis and the yogic school their most famous text starts off with the phrase suppression of mind. He said, I'm not asking you to suppress thoughts or feelings or emotions because that's an act of a doer who is performing an action. He said that just increases the idea of personness. He said, what I'm asking you to do is to frame it properly. If there's anger or sadness or anything else, recognize that this is a state or a feeling that has occurred as an experience to someone. So he said, instead of wallowing in the emotions, which just makes them worse and stronger, 
He said, just try to see what it is that's experiencing them and hold on to the experiencer and not the experienced. So it's the same answer to every question. Everyone's looking for the magic bullet, the quick fix, and he's telling you what the magic bullet is. It's saying this I that you take yourself to be has no fundamental reality. It's just set itself up as a kind of squatter in your body, in your head, and it, it's running your life for you. Just go and challenge this squatter and tell him he has no right to be there. And the way you do that is by not allowing it to connect with all the ideas, thoughts, perceptions it wants to play with in order to validate its own self-existence. If you can do that, he said, it disappears. There is something that's true, that's something that's real, and it's not divided into subjects and objects. It doesn't consist of individual people occupying bodies, looking at other individuals occupying bodies. He said there's one essence, one substratum, in which all of manifestation is an appearance. So the correct way of understanding knowing this is to be that self, be that Brahman, be that substratum, and know that everything that appears within it is indivisibly your own self. You don't see it as something separate from you. You don't recognize that there are individuals who function in this self-made reality, who interact with each other. Once your own sense of being an eye inside a body vanishes, then what also vanishes is your view, your perspective on what the world is. It ceases to be an assemblage of different objects distributed in time and space. It becomes somehow uh, an uncaused manifestation in your own substratum, your own being, and that's what you are. But you've created this overlay of what he says is just no different from your dream. You've, you've created a projection which somehow obscures the source in which all this is coming out of. It's a bit like the pictures that appear on a cinema screen. It's like you somehow become associated with one character. You get excited when he's winning, you get disappointed when he's losing. But he said, that's just your idea. You've limited yourself to a particular portion of a manifest appearance. And by doing so, you've framed the appearance in such a way that you see everything else as other and different from yourself. You have decided, I am this character in this film. But he said, the film is just a seamless interplay of light on a screen, on a substratum. They're all pictures appearing to the oneself, on the oneself. And whether the pictures are there or not, the self is not affected. When the projectionist turns his camera off at the end of the show, you as screen, as substratum, are not touched or affected in any way whatsoever. You've realized that the whole of the appearance of the world is a projection on a screen. You've stopped identifying with one corner of it. You've had a good look at the eye which thinks, I am this character in this corner of the screen, interacting with all the other cinema characters. You've watched it disappear. You've discovered that your true nature is the substratum underneath. And when you identify with that, all of these other projections are known to be false and unreal, and you no, you no longer think, this is me, this is my world, this is my drama. When your perspective becomes the source, Brahman, then nothing that appears in it is seen as different from you. Everything that appears in it partakes, if you like, of that same reality that you are. So in the Indian tradition that Ramana is based in, if you like, the idea of what's real is not the same idea that we have in everyday language in the West. The Indian idea of reality is it has to be there all the time. It has to exist and it has to shine by its own light. Now that, that's an interesting qualification. So any, anything that depends on something else is not regarded as real. So in the same way that the light that comes off the moon is reflected from the sun, Anything that derives its being or its sense of existing from something else is not regarded as truly real. So it has to be there all the time, it has to have being, existence, and it can't be contingent on anything else for its continuity. So all the teachers in that tradition would say the only thing that meets that rather narrow set of definitions 
is the unmanifest self, it's Brahman. So other things might appear in the unmanifest self, in Brahman, but you can't give them reality because they appear and they disappear. From Ramana's point of view, that's not real. That's a projection you've invented for yourself. The state of jnana, the state of knowing, is everything is your own self. You can say everything is an appearance in the one. When you are that one, when you are the substratum, then you don't recognize or see anything as distinct or separate from your own self. So you, you don't see anything as being something separate from you that has to be witnessed. You don't, re you don't recognize the independent existence of objects or other people. You know them to be your own self. There's nothing that you can use to frame it and say it's like this. Everyone you meet who's got this state, no matter how good they are with words, no matter how good their mind is, they say, I can't tell you anything about it because whatever I describe isn't what it is. But one thing that you do have is a sense of absolute ind indubitable certitude. There's something about the knowledge that you've discovered, you don't gain it, you discover it, which you suddenly realize was there all the time, which is so incontrovertible that no, nothing else anybody says can ever, ever dissuade you from this fact of your own experience, the fact of who you are. The best analogy is when you wake up in the morning and you laugh and you say, well, how could I have believed all those things that were going on in my dream? There's an instant of waking up that gives you an absolute knowledge of what's true and what's real and an immediate understanding that everything that preceded it in the dream world wasn't true. When you discover this substratum, there's a moment of, ah, yes, that's who I really am, that's what's true. Everything else was just froth on the surface. It was an imagination that I imposed on the only true real thing, which is myself. It's what's left when you've stopped making imaginary ideas about who you are and what the world is. When you, when you stop all that imagination, what's left is what's true. He used the term sahaja. Sahaja just means natural. This is the natural state. It's the only state there really is. And everything else is unnatural insofar as it requires some effort to sustain. He said, when, when the effort to sustain the idea of being a person vanishes, when you no longer regard yourself as somebody who lives in a body, who has to interact with other bodies to get by in the world, he said, what, what remains is this constant unchanging substratum, and he just called it natural. He called it, this is the Sahaja state. It's your true state, and it's the only state there is and you're not in it because you've imagined yourself to be a person in a body who has to make choices and decisions. In general, he did teach that all the activities that you undergo in this life are part of a predetermined script, but he also said that moment to moment you always have the opportunity not to identify with the person who is performing the actions in the script. So although he would say yes, there is a certain unfolding as a film unfolds according to the scriptwriter's instructions, he said there's a possibility to recognize that you are in a movie if you like, that you have a series of actions that you have to undergo, but the idea I am this person in this body performing these actions, he said that's your choice, that's not part of the script. He said you always have the opportunity to step out of the script and recognize that you're the ground, the substratum in which the movie is appearing and disappearing and not identify with the characters which are performing their destined actions. So he would say that choice is an illusion. It's an outgrowth of the idea. I live inside this body. I am a person. I will collect sensory data, stuff that I see, stuff that I think about. And on the basis of that, I will process it and then decide what I have to do next to continue my idea of myself and to protect this body that I think I live in. Once the fundamental individual I is discarded as being a fiction and invention, then the idea that there's either free will or predetermination goes. Ramana said they exist only so long as you think you're a person who occupies a space. He said there's no free will and there's no predestination in the self. 
but so long as you think that you're in a body, then you can argue about which is the more important, which controls your life. They're just uh, two bald men fighting over a comb. He said it's not anything that's really important, it's not something that you can argue about. It has no fundamental validity because the entity to whom free will or predetermination might apply doesn't actually exist. Somebody complained to Ramana, obviously with a scientific background, and says that what you're saying doesn't make sense. I want something scientific, I, I want a proper procedure. Ramana's reply, which I love it, is he said, holding on to what's real and eschewing what is unreal is the essence of science. I think that's a really good answer. So, so what you're doing on this is exactly what a proper scientist should be doing, is finding out what's true and what's real in a particular situation, holding on to that and discarding everything else which is not true, not real, and then you, then you find out the truth of yourself. So he's not asking you to take on board any ideas which are not testable. It, it's scientific insofar as his prescription for self-inquiry is a working hypothesis. He's saying, I did this when I was young, I succeeded, I found out who I was by having this question spontaneously appear inside me. If you want my advice, I would say ask this question yourself, follow it to its natural conclusion, and then you, you will discover for yourself what's true and what's real. You won't have any belief, you won't need me to tell you what's true or what's not. You'll find it for yourself. So in that sense, Ramana makes the proposition. He gives you a working hypothesis. He asks you to test it yourself by looking at this invention inside yourself, which you call I. And he said, if you conduct the experiment properly, the I that you're looking at will disappear. And in that act of disappearance, you will discover what's true and what's real. And he said that that's all that scientists are doing. They're trying to find out what's true by letting go of everything that's not true. I think there are people who have had good experiences. They've got very peaceful, very happy, very quiet. And they think, aha, that's it. And experiences can be very enticing, particularly if they're good ones. You think, oh, this is great. I'm getting somewhere. This is wonderful. But he said that that's just another entertaining delusion that puts your attention on something that's not yourself. He said the only, the only way to get out of the exit door, if you like, the, the only way out is to isolate the eye stop it playing with all these external phenomena, stop it getting excited by them, and go back to where it came from and disappear. The more entertaining things it can come up with, whether it's a vision or a city, the more likely it is to think, I, this person in the body, I am wonderful, I've had these experiences, I can do wonderful things. So your sense of being a person is enhanced by this, it's not diminished. That the way, the way to make it diminish is to take attention off these phenomena Instead, look at the one who has experienced them, the one who wants them, the one who sees them as something external, objective. Find the subject, hold on to the subject, and watch the subject disappear. I spent a long time with Papaji in the 1990s. He said there's two ways to find a teacher. The first is a geographical search. You, you can run around the world looking. You might get lucky, you might not. But he said, in my opinion, if you want it so badly that nothing else matters, then the teacher will find you. He'll knock on your front door and say, here I, here I am. I think you need a very, very high level of commitment and desire for that to happen. But he said that's the one guaranteed way to find a true teacher, is to, to want it badly enough. The problem is, if you have a functioning sense of, I'm a person who lives in a body, if you've got that overlay inside yourself, you have no capacity to ascertain who is or who is not in a state of transcendence. There's no faculty that you can use to determine, yes, this is a good one, this is a bad one. But the two criteria that Ramana advised people to use when they went to check people out was that the peace that you feel in their presence and the equality with which they treat all the beings around them. They're not guaranteed proofs, but he said they're quite good indicators. If you sit with someone and you find naturally, spontaneously, your thoughts are decreasing, you're getting quiet, there's something there worth staying for. 
then they do see and treat everything around them in a very equal way, a very egalitarian way. These are good signs. I would add to that, don't go for the people who want your money. <laughs> Somehow, if you're in that state, self looks after you, everything will be looked after. But if you decide, I've got some talent for teaching, I've got something to give that other people need, that's completely the wrong perspective. Ramana himself said that anyone who thinks that they've got something to give, that there are other people who are in need of it, is not a true jnani, is, is not enlightened. He said, don't, don't think that you're better than other people. Don't even think you're different from other people. Know yourself to be that, to be that self. And if people come and ask you questions, the right answers will come. They'll appear in your mouth and you'll say them. He never said, I'm a, I'm a guru, I'm a teacher. Because when, once you put that label on yourself, then you're accepting differences you're putting yourself in a position where you're better or more knowledgeable than somebody else. And from that perspective, you're saying, I have information, I have teachings, I have practices, which I think you will benefit from. The automatic underlying assumption of that is these other people are not in your state, that they need to be improved in some way, and that you need to give out advice to them to do something. That's not how somebody like Ramana sees himself or frames the world around him. He said, by remaining in that state, there is a kind of automatic energy is created around me. People come and they ask me questions and that energy field that's created by abiding in the self looks after all the people who come. It answers their questions. It helps them with whatever they need helping with. But it's nothing to do with me because there's nothing inside me that recognizes that there's anything outside me that needs assistance or help. I abide as the source, I abide as my own self, and by doing so that creates this presence, this energy which looks after everyone who comes. It's nothing to do with me and I don't do it because I see difference or suffering or people who need something from me. That's just an automatic consequence of me abiding in this state. So the greatest thing you can do for the world is to realize your own self. It's very counterintuitive. But the very act of knowing your own self, being your own self, somehow radiated or transmitted some kind of benefit to everybody in the world. He said far more so than any actions you can perform. You become one with the core or essence of all beings. And he said bye bye becoming one with that essence, you subtly benefit everybody else in the world. It's quite possible to be in this state in a cave in the Himalayas, to be in that state for your whole life and be of more benefit to the people of the world, even though nobody knows you're there, than the most industrious social reformer or politician. He said abiding as that state is the greatest benefit that you can confer to the world.